WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. It's me, Phil, and I'm back with another great episode with you, my friends. Listen, I want to thank everyone who continues to listen to my show uh, every Sunday at 12 noon. And for those who are joining me live on YouTube, thank you so much. Listen, I've got a great show for you today. I've got four powerful African-American women. We're going to have a great conversation. We're going to talk about why are black women so angry? Are they? Are they really? It's the, rip, the misrepresentation of African-Americans in America. So we've got Ashley Ali, who's here. We've got Jackie Porter. We've got Ivy Scott. And we've got my good friend, Summer Houston. What's up, ladies? Hey, Hi, Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you guys so much for being on. Y'all look beautiful. Thank you. Y'all got your wine. You. Summer got our candles and the incense. And we call, <laughs> we call Summer Erica Badu. It's a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I've known all of you all for a very long time, really the majority of my life. Um, and I know you all have a great perspective on being a uh, woman of leadership, a woman of power. You all have your own families. You're doing great things in the society. But there are some things that, that need to be spoken in our community. And there are some issues and topics that we're going to address today right here on the show. All right. So I want to get started. Uh, I'm a, I'm, we're going to go around the room, but I want to get started with my good friend, uh, Jackie Porter. Jackie, go ahead hey. and introduce yourself to <laughs> the audience. <laughs> What's going on? Um, uh, if you knew me prior to 2011, you know me as Jackie. Um, I go by Jax. Oh, <laughs> Jax. <laughs> FBI, Jax. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I um, I work in corporate marketing, brand building. Um, you know, started right out of college, climbed the the ladder, um, so to speak. And um, I'm just happy to be here tonight and to get to chat with all of the beautiful and accomplished ladies um, and get to really know some of the w women that have really shaped your life, Philip. I think it's kind of cool. Um, to get to engage with um, people that you know you have grown up with or have gotten to know over different courses of your journey. So thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And to Ashley Ali, what's Ooh. going on? Hey. You look beautiful. Thank you. First and foremost, uh, this takes me back to when we were seven and 10. <laughs> You know, we we said that we were going to have our own social platforms, whether that was a producing company or something. We were going to be major in the industry. So I think this is the kickoff to something major. You know, we always think because everything comes full circle. Um, but I'm so excited to that you invited me on. Uh, this is a very interesting topic um, that I think that a lot of people discuss around uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, so it's huge. And all of these women that are on here, I'm so excited. I've heard about them as the years have progressed. So it's good to see you all, thanks to the blessing of technology. Um, but myself, you know, I'm a mother of four young kids. In my previous career, I was, a, you know, a pretty senior management in leadership, you know, and but I was the only African-American female in my position on any brand of the company. Can you get excited about that? So my point is, is that so many of us who are not leveled up to where we could be for misnomers or misrepresentations of what people think of African-American women. So I would love to let this platform be a debunking of all of that mm -hmm. and allow people to see that we are multifaceted in so many different ways. Absolutely. And shout out to you just had a baby like two days ago. <laughs> Congratulations, yeah, girl. She has a lot of kids. That's amazing. Friends. A lot of kids, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're doing very well, and we're so proud of those amazing children that you have brought into the world. Yeah. Shout out to Ali, too. <laughs> I know. He <laughs> <laughs> To my friend Summer, what's going on, Decatur? Where it's greater? You're calling from Atlanta. <laughs> yes, I'm from Decatur. Absolutely, I am a real ATLian for sure. From graduating from Southwest DeKalb High School, Clark Atlanta University, Georgia State for graduate school. I am Atlanta through and through. But furthermore than that, I am a educator with the public school system right here in Atlanta, and being a product of the city, 
um, in more ways than one. I do see the way, you know, women of African descent are portrayed when they reach levels of leadership in education. And being from this city and educating in this city, I see that most of the children in this city that are served by our school systems are children of African descent. And when it comes to very serious situations, a lot of times um, major choices are being made by people that don't have equity in mind, that don't have what really is at the soul and depth of reaching our children have in mind. And then when you voice those opinions, of course you're angry. So I'm used to being the angry black woman in my extremely predominantly white upper crust elementary school. And so that's my perspective. I am actually a kindergarten teacher and then a mother of a kindergartner who also goes to my school. So I get to see that kind of, you know, behavior as both a parent and as an educator. And we're going to get back to it. You said something very powerful. You said equity. And that mm. is, is not equality, right? Okay. So let's go back to that when we get back to you. So to my friend Ivy, Ivy laid out her heart. I don't know if you guys saw the show last week. She talked about her personal journey. And if anybody deserves to be an angry black woman, <laughs> it's Ivy, but she's not. We would give, if you wanted to be one, you could, right? I'm just saying. So go ahead and reintroduce your friend. Yeah, so, um, because I didn't even do like a real introduction last time. Hi, everybody. Right. Hey, sisters. I'm so happy to be here. I just love being around all this blackness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this blackness. Um, right. But I'm from Dallas, um, and I was one of those people who went to predominantly white schools and um, was definitely known as, I'll just keep it real, the token black girl. And um, I was very, I was blind to a lot of things. I was um, nurtured, and I had a little bit of naivete uh, about what black people, what my people were going through, um, and I, I didn't see it until I got into high school. And I realized, like, wow, hold on. When somebody said to me, we really love you, Ivy, because you're not like them. I knew then that there was a problem. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, similar to Jackie, I have a background in global marketing, I have worked for some amazing Fortune 500 companies. And now I'm really focusing on supporting uh, small black businesses. And we'll talk about that at a later date. But I definitely have, um, from an emotional standpoint, really have a strong position about why we are angry and the trauma that has been tapped into because of that. But I'm going to let, you know, Philip do his show. Um, mm -hmm. But super happy to be here. And this conversation is well overdue. I'm excited to be a part of the dialogue. Well, you know what? Let's switch it up. Let's go right into it. I, let's bring that up. Um, and we're going to we'll circle back around. And you guys feel free to just jump right in. All right. We got an hour show. We got to make this happen. Let's talk about that. Ivy. Go ahead. Let's talk about the, the trauma. Uh, and does this idea of. Let me ask this question. Does the idea of the angry black woman, does that exist? Is that a true statement? I, if I may, I'll ahead, go jump ahead. in um, with a, a perspective on that. I think that angry is such a lazy uh, characterization of what we see manifested in terms of behavior or attitude or whatever it is that um makes people uh characterize black women that way i think a maybe better words might be sad like could they be hurt could they be um disappointed like there are all these other emotions um that i think drive some of the be behavior that gets classified as angry and black women never have the opportunity um, or given the grace or the compassion to look deeper, to explore um, what's beneath the surface. So I just, when I hear that word angry, I, I think it's overused. Um, and I think it's it's misused um, as a blanket statement for a variety of different um, feelings, emotions, expressions um, that show up, you know, in the world. That's a really good point. Does anyone want to jump in with that? Okay, so that, actually, that actually is so accurate um, because the word. Is, it, so first of all, anger is a is a human a reaction. People can have emotions. I feel like sometimes we we don't get a pass. Like 
everybody, there's angry white men, angry white women, there's angry, everybody gets angry. But then when you start dissecting that, it's PTSD, it's anxiety, it's depression. And we have a right. We have never, we as black women have not been given a pass or comforted to be angry. And, and the, the problem is that they look at our depression and say that, oh, she's angry or she's strong. They try to break down what our strength is and then make it anger. And then as a result, women are timid and they can't really um, be the, the natural strong woman that they wanna be. Oh, she's bossy. We immediately get that label, that label of being angry. And so it's like, how do we re-educate um, society? And how do we rebrand ourselves, if you will, and to say, no, it's more than just anger. Let me get a pass for the fact that I'm, I'm depressed because I'm not happy with myself. I'm depressed because I don't see anyone in media that looks like me. Um, I'm sad because I can't afford to take care of my family because I'm not getting paid the same salary as my white counterparts. And let's be honest, Ivy, I'm also tired. I'm weary. Yes. How about that? Yeah. A lot of you guys are worn out, right? You're tired. You're weary. Yeah. It's, 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 I mean, don't get me, don't, don't, don't get me saying the wrong thing, but a lot of women, a lot of black women hold down the fort. They hold down the families, or they are the, the matriarchs. They do a lot of things. And, and and sometimes it's okay to be tired. And it's okay to go off because guess what? Karen does it all the time. All the time. Well, I want to go ahead and jump in. That's that part of where that comes from. And I think that I want us to have the opportunity as Black women to give ourselves permission to allow ourselves to ask for assistance. I think the part of the, the major issue that we come from um, is let's talk about systemic, right? You know, from our grandmothers to our mothers to now us. And I think that our particular generation is changing the dynamic of what it means and being more open in communication. Because the issue is, is that we've been so suppressed in our ability to communicate the way that we feel, that we just kind of burdened it down and we passed it on from generation to generation. Because if you think about this, go back to when, you know, it was just like two minutes ago that we were working for the white woman in her home, coming home to have to deal with our own children, et cetera. And then now we get into corporate positions where we have to deal with that white woman, right? Who, you know, who, you know, had a, a black woman in her home, you know, raising and taking care of her, she feels as though that we're no longer equal. And so where we have to get better is that communicate the way that we feel before we catapult it, where it becomes that passion that's now deemed to be anger. And that's the part that we got to get better because I think that ultimately in the end, we all as black people, we have a certain language. Right. We often say that we don't, you know, like, oh, we don't have a native tongue, but we absolutely do. We have nonverbal cues. We have a lot of things that we can, you know, discuss amongst ourselves. But then when it comes down to the other counterparts, we wait until it gets to the point of, you know what? I'm she on my last nerve. It is because we don't give ourselves permission to communicate that very early on. And so I just want to say to everybody. Start communicating your feelings before they become something out of the ordinary where people start to label you when you could have just expressed yourself at the beginning. And so I'm saying that because this is what I had to learn very early. You know, you so, that's that's a good point you say, Ashley, because, you know, my mother always says this. You have to let people know up front who you are so it won't be any mistake. You got to I'm going to tell you, you know how we are in our family. <laughs> I'm going to let you know straight up who I am so it won't be any misinterpretation. Of what's going to happen. Summer, let's get you in this conversation. What do you think about this? I mean, unfortunately, white women tears have been weaponized. Oh, and God. they come from when there is any type of stance, a lot of time, any type of stance from a black woman. It's automatically seen as aggression. It is automatically seen as, you know, something to be afraid of, as if we are coming ready to fight over the smallest situation. And because of the way America has been set up, we have been taught to protect, save, and take care of white femininity when black femininity has been something that has been used by our country for centuries. And we've come out of, like what Ashley was just saying, the centuries of looking down, of covering our hair, of caring for your families and protecting your offspring, and now have come into our own when we're protecting ourselves, moving up in leadership positions, doing things in our communities and in our country and in the world that show strong leadership. But when we speak up 
with a voice of assurity, of confidence, and of conviction, then it's scary. Quite frankly, it makes me laugh. I giggle when someone is afraid when I'm speaking of something with something with confidence. <laughs> If I'm right. trying to come for you, you'll know I'm coming for you. It's not because I'm saying something out of a surety because it's something I went to school for, something I have experience from for. But it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Now, what is this sense of, because I think you said something speaking with confidence, because confidence is you're angry. Jackie from Jax. Uh, <laughs> so so I've got to get used to it. Being in corporate America. You have to have some, and all of you all that work in corporate America or some type of leadership position, you have to have some type of confidence, some type of air of, I know what the hell I'm doing. But it comes off as, oh, she's a little aggressive. Let's pull back. But guess what? When Roger does it, Roger's a man of conviction. Roger's standing on his own. What is that What is that about? And how do you go? Is it is it about the equity that we talked about earlier? Is it about I am here? I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm doing. It's That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I guess my experience with that or my perspective on that is, is maybe it sounds like it's probably very different from um, most of the, the ladies uh, on the panel tonight. Uh, early on in my career, I was always coached around being um, too meek and not being confident enough in my abilities and not um you know, having the courage to step out front and, you know, share my story, share my value, communicate my worth. And so those were things that, um, you know, were quite the opposite of my experience as I've, you know, if we're talking about, you know, the corporate or the, the career context of it. Um, but I think uh, a couple of the ladies tonight have touched on this idea or, or concept of, of femininity being um, sort of a, a lost or forgotten art with the Black woman over the course of, of generations, you know, like having to um, wear multiple hats and take on more responsibility and often, you know, being um sometimes forced to lead and and play both the, the masculine and the feminine role whether it's you know at home or in the workplace i think you know a lot of wires have gotten crossed and there's a lot of hard wiring that we have to undo um but i find when i can sort of tap into um, my femininity, my calmness, and, and some of those other things that make me a woman, they actually make me more influential. They make me a stronger leader. I get things done through people. I get what I want. I get results. Um, and I don't have to leave dead bodies, <laughs> you know, in the background um, while I do it. So I, I don't know if that answers your question completely, but... That's my perspective on it. Go ahead, Ashley, look like you want, you want to say something. Well, I just, you know, it was something that you were talking about, about femininity, Jackson. One of the things that I really want, and I think that we're getting there, you know, we're doing it a little bit differently than I would have probably portrayed myself to be, but being feminine, can we just normalize being a woman, right? Can we get to the place where we can be women and be accepting of what that means? It doesn't mean that you're less than than your male counterpart. But I am a woman. And when I when I and I work in a very male dominated field. Right. And so sometimes I wanted to kind of slide in in a way where I could somehow put on some kind of cloak and not be a woman anymore and kind of talk shop with the boys. And it's like, no, I am a woman who is in a male dominated field. That is by their choice, not anyone else's. I'm very good at my job. But yes, I do still want you to open up the door. <laughs> I still want you to do, to do the things that I think are appropriate for male and female relationships. I'm not going to sit up and have an indecent conversations, you know, in mixed company. And so I feel like as a woman, normalizing those male and male and female roles where we don't have to play that masculine role. I don't I don't play that very well because yeah, I, why do we play into that? Like why? Why have we, I, I feel like as a collective, obviously we're generalizing here, but I feel like we take that on, that whole strong black woman 
character, we all feel the need to play the role. And I, I don't know at what point in my career, the, the, and I keep talking about career, but I think in life, cause it shows up in how you relate to the men you date and, you know, um, other relationships outside of romantic and, and professional. But um, when you just decide that I'm not going to, I don't want to be strong. I don't want to um, be the boss and do it all and, you know, have it all on my shoulders. Um, people conform and bend to my will. And, you know, I, I set the temperature in the room and everything conforms to me. And I think it's just, um, it, it's realizing <laughs> that we've relinquished that, that right, <laughs> that birthright and taking it back. And then the atmosphere just shifts. Absolutely. I think I'm historically it's who we've had to be though. Historically it's who black women have been. We have had to because of the way the country set up, you know, just policies against us as a people. Black women have been had to been had to historically be in positions where we've had to be more stronger. Or, or some might call it more masculine than we, we should have had. I mean, if we even want to go back to slavery or even past that, you know, removing black men from the homes, uh, you know, incarcerating them at higher rates, not allowing them to live in, in housing projects with their wives and children, like really specifically trying to tear apart the black home left women having to do everything and so when you're blessed and i i do think it's a blessing to have had women in your life um as your parent or your grandparent or your teacher or your your girl scout leader or your coach who show that strongness it really comes from generations of having no choice having no other choice but having to do that i think that's something that makes me proud to be a millennial although my nieces who are like gen z kind of joke on us about is that we are the generation that finally said okay mental health is pretty much more important than physical health like you have to see about your head like Absolutely. we got to the point where we said we love our moms, we love our grandmothers and respect them and would not let anybody disrespect them, but we see some things that could be done better. We see that there's a mm -hmm. point, like Ivy said earlier, and recognizing and saying, I'm depressed, I'm Absolutely. not okay, I'm anxious, I'm upset, I can't do this right now. I cannot do this right now. And, and, and stepping back, whereas, you know, people in the generation before us would just take it on, just took it on. Right, and didn't have to. Here, here's a really great part. Um, Ivy and I talk about this all the time. We talked about, and we are, we're all of different religions here. We talked about having Jesus and having therapy. You need both. And I think in our society, we in our, and we're all from like the same background. We don't talk about therapy. We don't talk about getting healed. So let's move. Let's shift the conversation. I want to talk to you. You, some of you brought up, and Jackie, Jax, you said something too powerful about um, you um, months ago about things being passed down through mothers. Let's talk about that. The whole mother thing, the maternal thing. As you said, yeah. let's talk about the <laughs> Let's talk about the maternal um trauma that's passed down and not dealt with. Go ahead. So um I, I've talked to my mom about this and my grandmother. So it's no um surprise. So and, and Philip and I have talked about this too. So um, we talk about breaking generational curses, right? And it's like, it's not about necessarily breaking a generational curse. It's about planting that new seed. And so our mothers did the best that they could. And I think Summer said they did the best that they could. Thank you so much. But the reality is that our mothers, based off of what they knew, was like, you got to suck it up. You got to be strong. Wipe those tears away and stop crying because you ain't got nothing to cry about. And you don't need a man for nothing. You go and you go get your own. And that's that was survival, though. That's what they knew to survive because they weren't giving the permission. They weren't given the resources. They weren't given the tool. They weren't giving the opportunity to heal. And so what we have to do and what a lot of women fail to do right now is actually stop and make and acknowledge the fact that I'm hurt. Acknowledge the fact that, you know what, 
my mother did the best that she could, but that probably wasn't the best advice, right? So now I need to take it upon myself to understand why I feel this way. Why am I still repeating history? Why am I doing exactly, making the same mistakes that my mother made? Why, what is that? And I know for me, I had to have a conversation with my mom, a very real conversation. I think Ashley talked about this earlier, is communicating, forcing your families to have those com those really tough conversations. We are of the generation now where we can do that and we can tell our family, stop. We need, to, we need to love each other more. We need to talk about historically what is wrong with our family, the people who were raped, the people who were victimized, the people who were abandoned. Like that stuff, it sticks with you and really tapping into your younger self. And so I know part of my journey of healing was really tapping into that four-year-old me. My dad, I met my dad when I was four and I never saw him again until last summer. When he decided not to be in my life anymore, my mother said, you're going to be okay. I wasn't given permission to cry. And I knew I had to be strong because if I cried, my mom was going to look at me like I was weak. Mm. And so my whole life, I've been putting on this front trying to be strong. But deep, deep, deep down inside, I didn't know that there was this four-year-old girl who was abandoned. And as a result, she was trying to find a man to fill that void. So to answer your question, Philip, yeah, there is unfortunately trauma. People say daddy issues. It's not daddy issues. It's, it's parent issues. And that being said, that's when you have to stop and say, I'm not going to blame my parents. Now I have to take accountability and I have to seek mental health. I have to speak. I have to seek spirituality support. I have to find the people who actually have the tools to help me and not just go run to my mama or run to my best friend because they still dealing with their own garbage and their own baggage that they need to handle. Because I guarantee you, if we have, I want to do a part two of this series, but I want to have older black women on. Mm. Our conversation is going to be totally different than what we're talking about right now. I guarantee. Because yeah. oh, yeah. when we think about our mothers and our grandparents, you guys, I don't know about your family, but on both sides of my family, my, the grandmothers had their kids young, very young. And so you're talking about kids, kids growing up, trying to figure stuff out. So by the time they had a certain age, now they realize. So we're all like mid 30s. So we're having kids now. We're not our parents. We're on a whole different level mentally than they were. Right. Uh, but who wants to jump in? I'm sorry. It was, it's really about life experiences and building trust. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that the trust gets broken very early on in the dynamics of female relationships, which is why, you know, how, like you hear women say, I don't have women friends. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, girl, you are missing out on so much. Right. Like you need your sisterhood, your social circle to, to dive deep in. A man can does not understand you and your dynamics of what it is to be female. Right. He can tap into different things that feed into a different emotion. But the trust level of womanhood starts with your mother. Right. And so as you gravitate towards the women that are in your life, it, it's going to begin with her. And I often say, you know, I didn't really miss out on a lot as a child. Like even though my father wasn't in my life. I wasn't traumatized by his lacklusterness. What I wanted was a better relationship with my mother. What I wanted was that, that ability to go and say, hey, you're just like me. You look like me. I want to be you. I want to walk in your shoes. I want to wear your perfume. I want to be all things because I see you and you're the closest thing as a hero to me. When I'm a little girl and you see your mother get dolled up and she has a beautiful dress on and she walks out the room and you just want to stand in her essence. And so when you when the moment that your mother shuns that from you, right, and doesn't build that relationship with you and have that conversation. And, I, and I'm going to break something down very because obviously you brought up the part about her being different religions. M me being Muslim gives me a completely different aspect and outlook of what it means to have a womanhood, because I have girlfriends from different countries. And when I tell you the difference of what it means and how they raise their daughters versus what I was raised, I'm going, I'm kind of missing out on a lot of things when it comes to that, not having that boundary with my mother, because as a black woman, don't ask me that. Don't question me. Don't talk back to me. Don't <laughs> ask me why. It's none of your business. And so you don't, you know, you wonder why things happen. And then you grow up going, that happened to you? That's what, you know, you, you, 
Is that why you told me that? But you're not keeping it real. I don't want to know the ins and outs of everything that happened to my mother. But what she can do is give me a better guidance and a better opportunity to kind of know, hey, if you turn left on this street, this is what to expect versus that's just how it is. Because it's not how it is. I could have made much better decisions in life. And maybe I wouldn't have been labeled angry from the from the time I was 16 years old to the time I became 25 because people were all like, she never smiles. Why is she so mean? And realistically, I'm sitting up here like, I'm really a nice person. But my outward appearance does it doesn't reflect that. Why? Because I'm holding back because I'm I don't have a trust factor. And that started in my household. Point blank and period. Ahead, Strong so women in our lives really leaned on um, you know, a lot of old time religion which they, you know, believed in pouring everything they had into their prayer closet and coming out and a miracle, like over a miracle, everything was going to be different. So you could be being physically abused and you were going to go into your closet and pray about it. And Jesus was going to pluck this man out of your house and have him stop beating you and your kids. And, you know, you were going to go to bed every night, at least try to lay down without crying yourself to sleep at night, but you was going to pray or you were going to fast for a few days and then that was just going to be it and God was going to it, the whole idea it, now that you look back on it's kind of like oh, it's a little sketch now I'm with you Phil you said something earlier that I just wanted to tie into and Ashley shared this as well you know, different religions, a hybrid of religion. What I would like to really look at is the spirituality of what the angry black woman has to do now to kind of keep herself grounded. As you can see, I mean, you can barely see me now because I'm like house just <laughs> dark, just calm. But it really is a different part of my parenting because I don't want to pass some of those things down to my son that came to me. But like Ashley was saying, I, like Ivy was saying, the idea of asking a question, and not getting a real answer is just because that's the way it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to cry. You're, you know, you're supposed to be. No, no. You're going to sit down here with this singing bowl. We're going we're gonna to knock this ting shot. We're going to say over. We're going to meditate. We're going to say affirmations. You're going to believe in yourself. You're going to pray to God, but you also are going to work on what you need to get done. You're going to think about it. You're going to say it. You're going to mention it. You're going to manifest it, and it's going to happen to you. And I've decided to pour that into my son since he was two. He'll sit down and tell you all of his chakras, and if he's having a, a feeling or a thought, he's going to be able to tell you what's misaligned and what he's going to say to feel better. If I would have said this to my mama, mama would have called me crazy. And I have to remind my mom, Phil, you be calling me crazy sometimes too, but I have to remind my mom that doesn't separate me from God. I'm not separated from God because I choose to talk to my son a different way because I choose to, you know, let my anger out or my feelings, my regular human emotions. I choose to let them out in a way that lifts me up instead of keeping me down. That's all. That's all that's different. Sam, I do the same thing with King. And he's only, <laughs> I do the same thing. He's only 20, he's almost two. And he's affirmations. I'm like, cry, get it out. You mad? Yeah. Get it out. And I don't I don't call you crazy. Right. You know, you like my Erica my new soul sister. <laughs> and Summer has always been like that. Listen, in college, she had instance, all kinds of stuff going on. That's a whole other story. <laughs> but, but you know what we're talking about? I, I, I that, think the generational stuff is incredibly yeah. powerful. And I, I think there are a lot of us that are walking around angry and and upset and hurt about things that we haven't even experienced, but the women in our lives and, you know, or family members, we can broaden that, but they've set an expectation, you know, to expect the least um, or that you can't do this or that. And, you know, it creates this ceiling that you don't even realize is there. Like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard comments like, you know, I think someone said it earlier, you know, don't expect nothing out of a man. You got to do this for yourself, you, you know? And it's like, is that really true? Or did you choose, you know, the wrong man, auntie, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But Jack, you make a good point. Like, change is not like there's nothing wrong with like uh, encouraging your child to be independent, right? It's more so don't bash the opposite sex. It's more so 
gain an education so that you can empower yourself and find your craft, right? It's all about how you do things and how you say it. So it almost made this clash between men and women. Like you took away your innocence. As soon as you went into dating or before you even thought about dating, you heard the N word ain't right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you mm -hmm. already got you already got a blockage. You're already mm -hmm. like defending yourself. Like, uh oh, I'm in defense. You're expecting I'm people to up. come at you wanting to take, or you you know, like you don't think that you can have the things that you want. I was talking to someone just last week that uh, shared that her mom used to say to her, "Well, if you want a man that's gonna do this and that, you're gonna have to marry a white man." <laughs> You know, setting an expectation yeah. as a 12 year old that, right. you know, that don't expect age. a black man to regard wow. you that way or treat you that way. And not to say that, you know, I, I'm sure she meant well <laughs> advising that way, but it was it was not right. It was wrong. It's rooted in her experience. But those types of ideas get projected onto us and then we go into the world um, expecting for it to be hard, expecting to have to do everything, um, you know, and, and it goes beyond, I think, setting expectations around the opposite sex, sex and relationships. There are people who should be starting businesses that aren't because their family, you know, tells them that that's too hard or that's too risky. And they ain't never tried to start a business. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, we're listening to our parents, but their advice is based on their experience, which was very different from ours. They didn't have the resources that we have. They didn't have the education, you know, because of their sacrifice, we've gotten further, faster. And that uh, gives us uh, the possibility of having different opportunities and different choices. So, you know, you I think with maturity, you learn to filter um, the advice that you get. Some of it's a gift and you love it and, and you use it, you wear it. Um, and then other things you put in the closet, right? Um, but I think I've had to grow and it's, it's taken age and maturity for me to realize where, you know, my mama and my granny and my aunties, there are a lot of times their advice was spot on. And there were a lot of times where there were flaws with it. And I think through growth, through therapy, you know, through girlfriends and conversations like this, you, you know, you you realize that and you grow and you're able to do better. You know, I'm glad you guys pivoted the conversation. This is good. This conversation is going great. Because uh, <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk to you about the relationship aspect of angry black women. And it's so funny. Before we got on this show, I posted on Facebook. Why are black women so angry? Tell me what you think. The overwhelming majority of older black women, they said it's because of you men. It was all men. It was men, 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 men. Older black women. Y'all go to my page after this, y'all see. So clearly there is some kind of thing going on. Uh, but let's talk about that. Relationships. Dating black men, whoever you date. Has Have men been the cause? Have we been the cause of your stress, anxiety, um, dysfunction maybe? I mean, no, it, it just no, doesn't no, For me, and I'll just say this because, right. um, you know, I, one of the things that I think that I did well in picking a mate, you know, as I matured and I dated, I mean, you know, you're talking, I mean, I only had like a, like two real relationships. Let's just be clear. I've been with the same man for a long time. But prior to that, I think that my thing with picking a mate, I often chose people who were very similar to my grandfather, right? And in a sense where the person can be the provider, that person demonstrates a, a sense of ownership of what it means to have family, that sense of, you know, their love language is gifting, et cetera. And then I find myself mimicking a lot of my behavior after my grandmother, which I had to kind of pull back for a second and go, you know what? I could see why relationships go wrong is because you haven't leveled the playing field and going back to the communication of what the expectation was, right? And so when you do couples therapy, and I know that I people have talked about that going to you know church, et cetera, to have that, but I often encourage people to kind of remove the religious aspect out of it so that you can have a clear mind when you're talking to a person who has an you know who can be objective about it. Because sometimes we get a little bit too far into the well, I'm supposed to do this because this was the rite of passage and I think you lose yourself and so now in my 11th year of marriage 
I look back and go, you know what? You were very immature in the way that you were handling that. That wasn't him. That was you. And then at the same time, were you really prepared for what this really means about, about having relationships? Because at the end of the day, a lot of times women blame the man. But then can we really step back and say, you know what, sis, you kind of didn't do that right. Or you didn't communicate that correctly. And then, yes, there are a lot of times where men mess up. They do. That human nature, whatever the situation is, it happens. But I think that we often too give, we don't give women a lot of check and balances where you could have said to you, we're fearful of that because we don't want to come off as women bashing, right? Because it's like, oh, but she's hurt. I get that. Let me let you live in that hurt. Now let's kind of go back and dive to see how could we have done that better? Did we do a good job going to this relationship and putting all these expectations on this man and he didn't give all you put all them expectations on you and then now we have forced this relationship to become something because we want it to be picture perfect. And I realized stop trying to live for other people. You're eventually going to get to where you want to if you guys are really working together as a team. I call marriage mergers, mergers and acquisitions point blank in the period. Sometimes when a bigger company comes in and buys a smaller company, they're going to keep a few things and they're going to delete the rest and they know what's going to be working best for the greater whole. And so some of those, you have to let go of some of those traumas and deal with those very early on and realize that, no, I don't have to fix your plate every time you come in the house. That's not my job. Actually, I don't even have to cook for you. That's not my job. Okay. <laughs> But if I want to do these things, be grateful in that, right? And so if he is providing and all those things, understand I can I can provide too. But if you don't want, if you don't want me to, don't get mad when I don't, right? right? And so don't throw it back in my face. And so these are things that we have to work better with. So no, I have not experienced where a man has put me in a position where I'm sitting up here mad at all the male species because he hurt my feelings. Because that's true that happens. But listen, if anybody listening, I would like my plate made for me. I'm <laughs> it Not the mic. Uh, I wanted to piggyback off of Ashley. Go ahead. Philip knows this for sure about me. Um, Hold on, two seconds. Have- Jackie, scoot over just a little bit. I, I've been looking at this whole thing. Scoot over to the other, the other side, other way. Yeah, that way. Just a little bit, because I have this box. I'm going to mean to tell you this. Right, please stay there, because the logo is over your head, and you keep going into it. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) You're going to be mad at me, Lord. I've been trying to tell you this the whole time, but go ahead. No, don't worry. Go ahead, Ashley. Um, Women, so no, men are not the reason for the headaches. Men are not the reason for uh, why we're angry. You're angry because of a multitude of things, but it, it you have allowed yourself to be in some of these really toxic relationships. A man, you will, you've seen the red flags. A man will tell you he don't want you. A man will cheat on you. He won't come home at night. He won't provide. He won't. He won't do all these things that you have these expectations of, right? But yet you still allow yourself to constantly be with him, lower your standards, and then you, you blame it on him. But you allowed that to happen. You knew what type of man that he was. As soon as you recognize what type of man he was, then you should have left. But you keep bringing him into your space. So with that being said, that's not his fault. That's you. That's self-inflicted pain because you're afraid to be alone, because you feel like you can't get anybody else, because you don't have the self-worth. So what? it's an escape goal to say, you know, what? I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to blame him. It's his fault. Uh-uh. He shouldn't have came home. He should have did this. Uh-uh, uh-uh, sis. You allow that. You should, first of all, you need to be selective about who you allow in your space. Number one, you need to have standards. Don't just get any old man just to have a man. Two, you need to have, back to Ashley's point, communication. You you explain and talk about what you want, what you desire. We talked about this before, Phil, your values. If your values aren't aligned, you can't change anybody, not a man, not a friend, not a coworker, not a nothing. That person is baked into who they are and there's no redoing that, okay? And then third, as soon as you start seeing the red flags, as soon as that person is, it's like a job. You you acknowledge, okay, this person isn't performing well. So then they go, they get a warning. You explain to your mate, these are the things that I'm not gonna accept. I'm gonna let you know now that if they continue, then I'm gonna have to leave this relationship because it's not good for me. As soon as they do it again, guess what? You need to peace out and then start healing yourself and move on. 
People are going to be perfect, but you can't expect it's too many expectations on a person to give you everything, to give you happiness, to give you joy, to give you peace. You got to have that with yourself first. And if you have that first, that foundation of self-awareness, self-confidence, self-love, then you can go only up from there. Then you can have the confidence to leave a relationship. You can have the confidence to say, you know, what, I'm going to wait this one out because I met him in the club. He had a whole bunch of girls around him. He might not be husband material just because he's trying to buy me a drink. Can we normalize dating around though? Can we normalize that? That is okay. Normalize, say that again. Can you normalize dating? Like yeah. Yeah. dating. Yeah. Yeah. You have to continue to keep staying in relationships and know no one has to know whether or not you did or did not. It's not about sexual, you know. It's not about that. It's not about that. Well, a lot of us are getting in relationships in our head and Ooh. being hurt and disappointed for no reason. Somebody <laughs> passed the offer plate. You know, and you know, and it's it's because we try to go into dating, making every guy the one, and it's like he's just a possibility, you know. And you should be exploring your options. But yeah. I think Ivy made a great point about a lot of women, and it doesn't matter if you, you know, I was t talking to a guy friend of mine who's a little younger than me about a girl he was dating and he's like, well, Jack, she's, she's in her 30. She's like 32. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> like, I just started like understanding myself in my early thirties. You know what oh, I yeah. mean? Like we think that because you're in your thirties, you know, you're seasoned and you figured it out all out. Like your thirties, you're just actually becoming a, an adult a little bit, <laughs> you know, you just live through a few things and have started to know a little bit of something about the world. And I think that self-discovery, understanding what's core to you, what your own flaws and limitations are, what things you absolutely need in a relationship to feel satisfied and happy and having your own interests and your own things going on. So you're not so dependent on this other person to feel um every crevice a lot of us don't have full lives and so when someone comes in you know they have to be everything to us and that's just impossible um but i think ashley brought up a very um uh, i think controversial topic um uh, about dating multiple people but i think that's really the answer um that a lot of black women are very resistant to um, I think it goes back to, you know, the religious, you know, upbringing that some of us have and feeling some kind of way, you know, does it make you a whole, you know, to be dating more, more than one person at a time. But um, I think that that is one behavior that I've seen black men employ that I think they actually do right. Absolutely. Yes. Listen, you don't have to lay it low and spread it wide, you know, but you can go, you can go out and get a good Denny's. Two ninety nine, pancake. You know, you can meet people. Go out and meet people, because that's what's wrong. People are so you only have this one type of person. You only dated one person, so you don't know what's out there. How you know what's out there? Go ahead. Does somebody want to jump there? Everybody has said it, mm -hmm. but you need to be happy with who you are. Right. Not right. only do we need to normalize dating people, having conversations, get to know ourselves, we need to normalize changing a career in our 40s, right. having kids right. in your late 30s and 40s, if for right. some people, if you're healthy right. enough to do so, getting married in your 40s. We, we're in these competition, these fake competitions yeah. with the people that we claim to be our friends to beat them to this punchline when really no one wins. No one's winning here. It's it's we do have to normalize making ourselves happy first. If you get to a point at 40 and you find that your job is not serving you, you find that the position that you're in is not adding to your life and you are unhappy, you change that. Dating somebody or dating or marrying somebody is not going to fulfill you in that way. It's not going to do it. If you are looking for another human being, as somebody just said, if you're looking for another human being to make you whole, you will always be disappointed. Now, people can generally just be assholes. Let's just keep it real. Like, I don't have a delay button. Don't cut. It's a live on the radio. <laughs> and and I be saying, when you realize that that's the situation, then you make a choice. 
You know, you make a decision to create happiness for yourself and you remove that person or remove yourself. Um, it's, it's almost like we don't see our choices. You know, it, it's like we we're, we feel like we have to bear whatever situation we're in or we have to sacrifice ourselves. It's almost, I think for black women, subconsciously, there is this nobility um, that comes with sacrificing. When Summer made a good point, we, we're put into this box. And I think that goes back to the, the angry part. You feel like, God, like, if I haven't accomplished everything by 30, damn, I don't have no more life to live. When in actuality, when you think about a full life, if you're blessed to live to you 80, you're not even halfway through at 30. You still have so much life to live. And I think that's where it's like being conformed. Like people are trying to check boxes and they're trying to meet this invisible uh, goal by 35 and they're disappointed because they're like, I don't have the husband, I don't have the kids, I don't have a job and I'm 35. It's managing expectations. It goes back to how you raise, knowing that life is a journey. It's a fun, life can be very fun and fruitful if you just allow yourself to not be limited by age. What is time? You know, people feel like they're running out of time. I gotta hurry and get married so that I can have a baby by this time. Bruh, if it is meant for you to have a child, you will have one. If it's meant for you to get married, it will happen. But don't feel like God is going to give you everybody they soulmate by the time they're 35. Furthermore, believe and know that you can have multiple soulmates. It's, it's about how you raise people in terms of being excited about life and not trying to meet all these different goals by a certain age. And as a result, you get angry about it. Like, damn, I'm not there. So you find yourself spiraling and spiraling with one man and trying to make it work. You're trying to make it fit for this one man because I'm 30 and I got to make it work with him. Nah, bro, like, that's okay. You know what? Y'all know I've been divorced. Okay, cool. I, I'm, I'm only 35. Even if I was 50, I'm only, I'm st I still got a life to live. There are people who you start over. It's okay. Even with me, I left corporate America and now, I'm doing my own thing. Absolutely. I think the permission to be expressive has to start very young. And for those of us who have young children, you know, to change the paradigm of what it means to be themselves. I have a daughter who's very eclectic. She self-express how she feels. And I let her do that because I don't want to have, I don't want to force her to conform when her spirit is leading her to dance in the aisleways, et cetera. Because guess what? If we see a Caucasian child in the grocery store with SpongeBob pajamas on, some rain boots, a Dora the Explorer backpack on, you know, an LOL doll flying it down the aisleways, we look at that going, oh, that is so, look, look at you. You want to get dressed this morning? But if that is a black child, and the mama had them in outside with the pajamas on, and you know she wrong. She has so <laughs> how, how dare she allow that baby? We have to do better with giving our counterparts permission to be expressive, and even if that starts with our kids, and giving each other grace, right? Because I think as sister circles, and we do it. You know, I have a gambit of girlfriends who are married. Some are divorced. Some had their kids when we were in college. Some don't have any at all and are, are in their 40s and are looking to fulfill that relationship. It's okay, sis. Give her grace to be able to do, to express herself like, hey, you know, I'm really looking to do it. Cause continue to keep encouraging each other to live a life where, because once you, you want your sister circle high fives you and says it's okay, chances are we leave that with ever more confidence than we ever had before. So it's going to start with us, right? Giving each other that permission and not silently saying, to each, you know, on, on the back end, I don't know if it's going to happen. No, we have to say, yes, go, sis, live. Go on your eat, love, pray. I wish I could go. I can't leave these kids. But I see you in Kenya on the safari by yourself because you need to <laughs> that. that should be okay to do. Right, absolutely. So listen, this has been a great conversation. You see how fast time goes by? <laughs> and you guys have really made a great, uh, this has been a wonderful topic. It, it has moved a lot. I have to bring all of you guys back, all of you beautiful women back. We're going to have some more conversation with y'all. But listen, before we leave, I want to ask you one question and I want to give you your final thoughts, all right? We have a few more minutes left. What would you tell your younger self? What would you tell your younger self 
you could go back in time right now, you could have a conversation with yourself. What would you tell your younger black self, your little black girl, and give your final thoughts? Summer, I'm gonna start with you. First, I would say invest in Amazon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I would definitely tell myself to trust my intuition. That, that voice I'm hearing, even though I have women that meant the world to me, telling me to be more fearful, telling me to pull back from it, telling me that there might be other options. I would say, follow your heart. Do exactly what your thoughts are saying. Pray. Follow your own intuition and don't be afraid to try new things. So that's what your youth is for. Your youth is for trying new things, making mistakes and worrying about it later. Great, great point. Great point. I'm trying to work this screen, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you, Ashley, what would you tell your final self? My final self? Or my next final self? self? Hold on. Let me start. <laughs> final thoughts. And what would you tell yourself as a young you know, man? No is a complete sentence. No is a complete sentence. I, I am a person who hates to disappoint. And sometimes that definitely leaves me with less than I would like to have. And so as I'm making decisions that I knew that was best for me, when someone else told me that I should do something else, then I should have said no. No, I want to do this because I feel like it's best for me. And at the end of the day, when I have taken the reins and done what my heart was telling me to do, it always worked out for the greater good. So absolutely no, N-O, period, is a complete sentence. Absolutely. I love that. And to you, my good friend Ivy, what would you say to your younger self? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Um, I would definitely tell my younger self, you are enough. You don't have to people please. You don't have to put on a show for anyone else. You are completely enough in who you are. It's okay to cry, get it out and love yourself, love every inch of you and be, and be confident in how God made you and not try to replicate and be like everyone else. Your voice is okay. Your face is okay. You are enough and you are beautiful and love you. And my good friend, Jax. <laughs> <Where's Brad>? um, <laughs> <laughs> you and Miss Phillip. Um, I would tell myself that you played it small. Um, you you got exactly what you envisioned and nothing more. Um I realize now that, you know, everything that I hope to achieve, I have, and I've done it in half the time that I thought it would take. And, and so I would push myself to think bigger, um, have a, a bolder uh, vision for myself and to know and be confident um, in my abilities. Um, that's what I would say. Oh, look at Summer. Okay, background. Uh, Summer done, listen, I'm looking at Summer in the green room. She done ran to the other room. <laughs> listen, <laughs> I, you don't have to put you, put you out like that. You're my friend. Listen, each of you play a huge role in my life. And I just want to say thank you to each and every, every each one, one, one of you all have been significant to me in my life. So that's why I wanted you guys to come together. And the energy tonight has been absolutely amazing. I love each and every one of you all. I wish nothing but success and favor over your life. I pray that you have no lack ever, and you always prosper in life, okay, you guys? So thank you so much. So just hold tight for me in the green room, all right? Hold tight okay. okay. Listen, we had a great show today with four beautiful African-American women, Ashley Ali, Jax, Ivy Scott, and my good friend Summer Houston. They all played a significant role in my life, and I just want to thank each and every one of them for coming on. Listen, we must learn how to protect our black women. They are the jewels of the world. They have birthed so many things and so many good things to the world. We must protect them and we must honor them. They are not angry. They have a voice. It must be heard. They must be respected. And we must love on them to the last day here on earth, right? So listen, I'll be here same time, same place every Sunday right here on WHCR. I'll be in this virtual space 
I love you guys. I'll see you guys next time. All right. Holla. Peace.